Good afternoon. My name's Ed Howard. I'm with the Alliance for Health Reform. And I want to welcome you on behalf of uh, Senator Rockefeller and our board of directors to this program on the basics of Medicaid. Uh, now, you may know this. Um, a lot of people don't. In terms of enrollment, Medicaid is the biggest health insurance program in America. As of last June, the enrollment hit 50 million, I believe, for the first time, more than Medicare, of course. And over the course of the year, it, it uh, covers even more, 60 plus million. The other thing is that it's costly. Um, counting both the federal and state government shares, its price tag was projected to exceed $400 billion in fiscal 2010. Two other things you ought to know about Medicaid is first that it's enormously important to the millions of low-income Amer Americans that it serves, and secondly, that it's incredibly complicated, uh, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to put this program together. And of course, it's not only complicated, but it's complicated in different ways in different parts of the country. So uh, we, we're very pleased to have you at this program. So many states are, are grappling with budget woes, looking closely at their Medicaid program, which counts for a large part of their budgets. That's why um, this, prim this primer on Medicaid is even more important. We're very pleased to be the partner and the co-sponsor of this briefing with the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured, which is a major initiative of the Kaiser Family Foundation. You'll hear from the Deputy Director of the Commission, Barbara Lyons, in a moment. And, and I should note that the Commission's Executive Director, Diane Rowland, is also the Executive Vice President of the Kaiser Foundation and chairs the new uh, MAC PAC, which you may have heard of, the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, which is designed to do for those programs what MedPAC does uh, in the case of Medicare for Congress. Uh, this is first, by the way, in a series of primers that we'll be doing with uh, our colleagues at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Next Friday, there's a session on Medicare. If you're new to the Hill or new to the issue, uh, these primers are meant for you. Uh, the announcement for that one just went out this morning, so you should find it when you go back to your office. Uh, one thing that, that I wanted to emphasize, there are a lot of policy issues centering on Medicaid right now. And frankly, we're not here primarily to argue those issues out. Rather, we want to get you a basic understanding of how the program works, because the idea is it's a good thing to know what you want to change, or not change for that matter, uh, before you start debating those changes. So uh, thank you for coming. And at this point, let me turn to the, our co-moderator for today, Barbara Lyons, the Deputy Director of the uh, Kaiser Commission. Barbara? Um, thank you, Ed. Um, and thank you all um, for being here today. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to partner with the Alliance for Health Reform uh, to conduct these 101 briefings on the major health uh, programs. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that Medicaid is the first one um, up. Um, as Ed uh, alluded uh, to, and the panelists today are going to share in uh, much more detail, Medicaid does play a really important role um, in our health care system both nationally and in every state throughout the country, uh, providing financing for hospital, physician, and other medical services um, for millions of low-income Americans, and also importantly, uh, home and community-based services and nursing home care for people with uh, disabilities and seniors. Um, we often think of Medicaid in its health insurance role for families, um, but the bulk of the program's spending is really devoted to uh, people with disabilities and the elderly who have much more intensive um, health, health and long-term care needs. Uh, we did put um, on the outside table some profiles of the people who are served um, by the program, because we're going to talk a lot today about rules and um, uh, policies, um, but I think it's important to remember that the ultimate goal of the program is to help people um, meet their needs. 
Um, we've highlighted some of the different types of people served by the program, a mom with breast cancer, a child with a brain injury, an adult with disabilities who's trying to work um, and contribute to society. These are the people who the program is really um, all about and intended to, to serve. Um, the structure of our panel today uh, really reflects the structure of the Medicaid program. Medicaid is a partnership between the federal and state gover gover governments with um, shared financing um, within a national framework. Each state does um, determine uh, what their individual Medicaid program looks like, which is why um, we hear so often when you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. Um, there is a lot of variation uh, throughout the country. Um, the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the Uninsured has put a great deal of effort um, over the past 20 years into trying to collect information and conduct analysis on the Medicaid program nationally um, and um, collecting information from the states on who the program covers, what kinds of benefits are covered, how care is provided, and um, also how care is financed and the budget issues um, that states are facing. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Andy Allison um, on the panel and all the other Medicaid directors and state officials who have worked so cooperatively with us um, over the past several decades in uh, trying to uh, obtain this information, which really helps us get a better sense of the evolution of the program um, and the direction um, that it's headed, into, headed toward. Um, We've included some of these materials in your packets, um, but we have a great deal more um, on the Kaiser Family Foundation website and also available at statehealthfacts.org um, um, for specific state level information. Um, if Ed lets me take a, two more minutes, I just want to highlight um, some of the, the key, three key trends that we've seen um, in the Medicaid program over the past um, decade. Um, the first is um, the way that states have been responding to the growing gaps in health insurance coverage for the low-income population, uh, most notably expanding coverage for children um, through their Medicaid um, and CHIP programs. Medicaid's reach for adults remains very limited um, in most states um, today. Um, Medicaid plays um, an important role for the poor. The number of poor in this country has increased by 12 million over the past decade, so it should be no surprise that Medicaid enrollment is going up. In the face of the recession, um, enrollment has uh, climbed um, as more people have lost jobs and income and qualified um, for coverage as their incomes have gone down. Um, Medicaid's role has really played an important role in stemming further increases in the uninsured. Um, the, um, the additional federal um, assistance uh, that the federal government provided to states, $103 billion over 33 months, is uh, coming to an end um, at, the, at the end of June. Um, the second trend that we've noticed is um, the move toward more coordinated delivery systems. States have been um, working very hard to improve the way care is delivered to the people who are served under the program, looking to managed care, but also to other strategies to increase access to primary care, medical homes, um, and case management for people with, um, with disabilities. And then third, um, states have also placed increasing priority on increasing the availability of home and community-based services um, for people with disabilities, um, trying to avoid costly um, institutional placements, a very important direction um, for the program. So um, the health reform law um, builds on these trends, um, expanding Medicaid to more fully cover um, low-income uh, low people in 2014, uh, trying to fill in some of the gaps in coverage that we have today for adults, um, and also providing a number of opportunities for states to take advantage of new ways to provide care uh, more efficiently, more effectively for the population served by the program. So we've got a great panel today um, to look at these issues and to get the basic nuts and bolts um, about the program. So let me turn it back to Ed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Barbara. A couple of quick logistical notes. There are uh, a lot of good pieces of information in your kits, as Barbara said. There's also a sheet in those kits that lists a bunch of more resources that you can find uh, uh, online. There'll be a webcast available through um, the Foundation's uh, beneficence as of Monday. Uh, there'll be a transcript on our website, allhealth.org, a few days after that. You find all of the materials that you see in your packets 
and on the additional sheet on those web, both, both the Kaiser website and ours. Um, biographical information about our speakers, much more extensive than, than uh, we'll have time to give them credit for uh, today as well. Uh, and without any further delay, let's get started. Uh, as Barbara said, we have a terrific panel, and the first terrific member of that terrific panel is Robin Rudowitz. She's the Associate Director of the Kaiser Commission, been with them for about seven years. I had forgotten how long we had had this relationship. Uh, and she's been focusing on financing issues uh, during that time. She's worked on health and budget issues at every level of government, including a stint at CMS and in the private sector as well. So uh, eminently qualified to give us the, the brief overview of the Medicaid program. Get us started. Robin? Thanks so much, Ed and Barbara, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, we all know that Medicaid has certainly been front and center in the news in state governments at the federal level um, in terms of its fiscal impact as well as its role in um, implementing health reform. So in the next 10 minutes, um, I'm going to provide a real basic overview of the program to get back to the basics. And as Ed said, it's a really complex program. So these slides are structured in a way that there are five key takeaway points um, with lots of supporting um, evidence and data to support those points. Um, the first, as Barbara mentioned, Medicaid is really integral in the overall health care system. The program has a whole variety of roles in the current health care system. We are most familiar with Medicaid as a coverage program. It really covers certain categories of low-income individuals, primarily children, um, as well as some of their parents and about 15 million elderly and individuals with disabilities. Medicaid provides assistance to Medicare beneficiaries, and it is also the largest payer and provider of long-term care services, both in institutions as well as in the community. Medicaid represents one in six dollars spent in the overall health care system, and it is an important source of revenue, again, on the long-term care side, but as well as for safety net providers. Um, Medicaid is also, we know, uh, a major budget item for states. It's also an important revenue source for states, and the federal government pays a large share of the financing of the program. We have some recent polling data which shows that over half, or 59 percent of Americans, say that Medicaid is an important program for them or their family. And when you look at those statistics for the elderly, for those in fair or poor health, as well as for blacks and Hispanics, they are more likely to say that Medicaid is an important program for them. We know that Medicaid is integral in the health care system because it really does fill in the gaps in our health care system, providing benefits not often covered by private insurance or commercial insurers. Um, and it really provides a set of comprehensive benefits that really reflect the needs of the population that it serves. So really comprehensive benefits for children covered by the program, as well as a range of health and support services for both elderly and individuals with disabilities. Um, today, uh, the Medicaid eligibility levels are much more limited um, for adults than for children. There is very broad-based coverage through Medicaid and CHIP um, for kids. About 250 percent of the federal poverty level is the median eligibility for children across the country. And the Medicaid and CHIP programs cover over half of all low-income children um, in the United States and about 30 percent of all children in the country. Um, we know that the coverage is more limited for parents, and prior to the passage of health reform, states were generally prohibited from covering adults without dependent children on their Medicaid programs without a waiver from the federal government. This next slide really just depicts the variation across the states in the coverage um, levels for parents. And we see in this slide that really the majority of states, in the majority of states, coverage for parents is below the federal poverty level. And in 16 states, there's coverage below 50 percent of the federal poverty level. The second key takeaway point is um, related to Medicaid spending. And we certainly hear a lot about Medicaid spending, but this key point is that Medicaid spending, what drives it? It's really enrollment growth and spending for high-need populations. So we all know that during the recession, you see increases in the unemployment rate as well as um, declines in people's income and therefore increased demand for programs like Medicaid. 
Um, because of the federal legislation related to providing stimulus funds to the states, in order to get those funds, states were really prohibited from cutting eligibility, so eligibility was protected during this last recession. And since the start of this recession in 2007, we've really seen more than 7 million more people enroll in the Medicaid program. Our latest data shows that as of June 2010, Medicaid enrollment exceeded 50 million, program, 50 million people um, on a monthly basis, the largest uh, number on record. And we know that this enrollment growth is really what's putting pressure on Medicaid spending growth. So as enrollment uh, grows, that's putting, um, that therefore increases spending. However, when you take out enrollment as a key driver of Medicaid spending and you look at what Medicaid is spending on a per person basis, you really see that Medicaid spending growth per enrollee has been slower than growth in the private healthcare market. So if you look at total Medicaid per capita growth over the last decade of 4.6%, that compares to national health expenditure growth of 5.9% over the same period, and increases in monthly premiums for employer-sponsored coverage of 7.7%. Again, as Barbara said, we know that Medicaid uh, spending is concentrated in the elderly and disabled, so they represent about two-thirds of spending on the program, but they only represent a quarter of the enrollees. And when you drill down a little bit further, we know that individuals who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid account for only 15% of Medicaid enrollees, but a staggering 40% of Medicaid spending. So the third key takeaway point that I want to talk about is that Medicaid increases access to care using private providers, and, but a recognition that Medicaid is still purchasing care in the private market. So despite the fact that Medicaid enrollees are sicker and more disabled than individuals with private insurance, we see on this slide that nearly 40% of low income, of poor individuals on the Medicaid program report fair or poor health, and many have limited ability to work. We really see that access um, is comparable to the access that individuals receive in private insurance and far superior to access for those who are uninsured. And those um, measures of access are good on Medicaid for both adults and for children. We also know that most states have opted to deliver care in managed care settings. So for data for June in 2009, we know that over 70% of Medicaid enrollees were enrolled in some type of managed care plan, either a fully capitated plan or some type of primary care case management, but states are really managing um, the care that individuals are, most individuals are receiving on the program and ensuring access. So the fourth key point here is that financing for Medicaid is shared by the federal government and the states. And this is something that um, we've certainly talked about. This map shows how costs are shared. There is a formula in the law that sets the federal matching rate, and that formula is based on a state's per capita income. It ranges from a floor of 50% to about 76%. Of course, states are receiving a bit more than that now because of federal stimulus dollars. But the system is set up so that poorer states receive additional or more financial help paying for the program than, um, than states with higher per capita income. We certainly also hear a lot about Medicaid in-state budgets. So this slide shows really when you look at Medicaid um, as its role or as its um, in-state budgets, it looks pretty comparable to what states spend on education um, in terms of total spending. However, when you pull out the federal revenues that states are getting, um, um, to support the program, and you look at just what states are spending of their own dollars on the program, you see that about, states spend about one in six dollars of their state general fund dollars on the Medicaid program. So a far second compared to education spending, which is over a third of state general fund spending. 
We know that healthcare is one of the few sectors of the economy that continues to grow even with the recession. Um, in the report this morning, it showed that there was um, additional increases in healthcare employment. Um, and when states spend money on their health care um, or their Medicaid program, they're, again, drawing down these federal dollars that then result in um, flows through their state economies and, in turn, result in income, revenues, and jobs at the state level. And then I'm going to end, really, with a little bit of the fifth key point here is about Medicaid and its role in health reform. So med the Medicaid expansion in health reform is expected to contribute significantly to the reduction in the number of people without insurance. And we also know from analysis that we've done that the federal government is expected to pick up the majority of those costs. And this last picture here, before we sum up, is really just a brief look at Medicaid. We talked a lot about Medicaid's roles today. And really, health reform, again, builds on many of those roles by expanding coverage, but providing lots of additional federal financing for that coverage, as well as adding new options in the long-term care arena to help better coordinate um, care for high-need populations. So amazingly, sticking to my um, 10 minutes with 30 seconds left to sum up, um, I just want to recap some of, the, um, <laughs> uh, some of the key points that we talked about. One, that Medicaid is really an integral um, piece of the overall health care system, um, providing help to lots of low-income folks and stemming the increases in the uninsured during recessions and economic downturns. Medicaid spending um, is not... Um, out of control, but really driven by enrollment growth and spending for high-need populations. Uh, Medicaid increases access to care, but again, still is purchasing that care in the costly U.S. marketplace. Um, financing for the program is shared um, across the federal government and the states, and Medicaid will play um, an important role moving forward in the implementation of health reform. Thanks very much, Robin. Uh, let me just uh, make sure that everybody knows who you are. Uh, <laughs> and, and to express how pleased we are to have you, uh, Cindy Mann, who's the HHS official responsible for both Medicaid and CHIP, among other things, within CMS. Uh, it's her second period of service at CMS, actually having done a lot of heavy lifting implementing the S-CHIP program uh, back in 99 uh, to 2001. Uh, in between, she was the executive director of the Georgetown Policy Institute Center for Children and Families, and today she's going to tell us not only what Medicaid's doing, but about preparations for its role in the reformed health care system in the future. Cindy, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Ed. Um, and thanks to the Kaiser um, Commission on Medicaid and Insured and Kaiser Family Foundation for putting this together. It is a, um, people say it's a complicated program. I think it's pretty simple and straightforward, but um, it probably helps to have a primer um, and to help people go through it. I am going to talk about, as Ed said, both a little bit about getting ready for 2014 and about where we are right now in the Medicaid program because I think it is fair to say that both for the federal government and certainly for the states, we are uh, flying the airplane while we're uh, completely rejiggering the engine. Um, 2014 is uh, maybe seems far away, but I think to, to Andy um, and, and to me and to uh, those of us uh, working on the implementation, it is, uh, it, is, it is now, it is here, and uh, the kinds of things that we need to do to get make 2014 a success need to happen today, yesterday, and tomorrow. So it is very much part of our presence, even though um, uh, obviously there's lots else going on. So let me start by just uh, briefly uh, talking about what we're doing in terms of implementing. Um, we're doing a lot of work with states. Um, it has been a, uh, uh, a new experience for us in the Medicaid business at the federal level, and I venture to say, from, I've heard from my colleagues at the state level, also true with them, um, that we've been branching out in terms of who we work with and who we talk to about implementation because it is very important, certainly at the federal level, that we not just work with our state partners um, but work with um, uh, insurance commissioners, uh, governor's health policy people, because as you'll see, a real uh, central part of the implementation 
uh, roadmap for Medicaid going forward is to be part of a broader system. And that for us means that Medicaid, CHIP, employer-sponsored coverage, and the exchange really need to operate as a system. So our work together with, at the state level has involved an array of players, obviously first and foremost our Medicaid and CHIP directors, but an array of players. And so too at the federal level we've been working with our partners at Treasury and, uh, and the IRS as well as um, the um, uh, Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, fondly known as SOSIO. Um, and of course, we've been having a lot of stakeholder meetings, hearing what people think health reform means, how we can properly implement it, and do the best we can as we as we go forward. And we've been issuing regulations and guidance, and you will see in the in the course of 2011, quite a bit more aimed at 2014 coming out this year. We've issued lots of guidance since March 23rd, 2010, a, 10, aimed mostly, although not exclusively at some of the uh, provisions in the Affordable Care Act that are effective this year um, and even last year. Um, but we're um, increasingly moving our, our guidance towards 2014 and the, um, in the spirit of 2014 is now. So if you look at the sources of coverage for Americans, and this actually looks at coverage just for people under 65 in 2019, it, it tells an important story, it seems to me. Um, what you see is, first of all, that the largest uh, group of, uh, sort, uh, largest group of Americans will get their coverage through employer-sponsored coverage. So just as they do now, um, employer-sponsored coverage will remain the largest uh, single source of coverage for people under 65 as health reform is fully implemented. But the second largest source of coverage come 2019 uh, will be uh, Medicaid and CHIP. And that's, of course, because we're already building off, as, as Barbara and Robin made clear, a pretty robust base of enrollment, a strong program that's been around for many years, and we're expanding on it. So uh, the second, uh, the, the other part of the pie that to point you to is the exchange is 24 million people, so that is the biggest delta. The, it starts with zero now, at least at the federal level. Some states have their own exchanges, but from the federal perspective, there's no one on an exchange that we're now paying for um, directly. So that goes from zero to 24, 24 million people, so the biggest change. But as you see going forward, um, Medicaid is uh, and shipped together, and it's mostly Medicaid, is just a very significant part of the fabric of coverage as we move forward. And so what that means I think going forward is really a very different paradigm in how we think about Medicaid and CHIP. First of all, I think, and, and I think this has been happening in states around the country already, particularly with respect to their kids' coverage, is it's too big to be thinking of as, oh, yeah, 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 Medicaid, that safety net program, I should think about that. We don't think about that uh, Medicare that way. Medicare is a major public program for people over 65 and for some people with disabilities. Many people over 65 have private health insurance coverage, have a retiree health insurance coverage, and Medicare is available to them. But I think we all understand that it is a major source of coverage for people over 65. Similarly, Medicaid is the major source of coverage and will be certainly without a lot of holes in the system that it now has the major source of coverage for people who are low income and the people who need long-term care services. And I think getting away from mm, thinking about it at the end of the line of a list of other possibilities will get us to, to position Medicaid and CHIP in a way that will assure the kind of coverage, quality, and cost containment goals that I think we all want to see out of health reform. Um, Secondly, is the, the, to get us where we're going in 2014 and, and beyond, it requires a vastly different set of rules in the Medicaid program. Much more simplified rules. We get to these numbers, um, not just because somebody's turning on the switch and saying more people are eligible for Medicaid, but because fundamentally ways in which the program operates will change. And the concept will be that everybody who's eligible for Medicaid needs to be enrolled. And then most importantly, it seems to me, in terms of the new paradigm, which is related to points one and two, is that we need to think of Medicaid as being part of a system, and we need to implement it in that, in that spirit. So if I, if I um, uh, show you the next two slides, I'll skip over them pretty briefly, but they really tell you why Medicaid grows 
in the next world, and it's really uh, pre, um, uh, preordained by the, the story that, that Robin gave us, which is that we have a lot of holes in our Medicaid system. People think that poor people are covered in Medicaid. Not so, and what you see here is um, it varies by your category. If you are a parent, if you are a, medic, uh, if you are a kid, if you are a non-parent, um, your chances of being covered by Medicaid vary considerably because our eligibility rules in the program vary by category. But if you look at the next slide, what you see is that pretty much goes away. And come 2014, all adults will be covered at least to up to 133% of income, and it'll be a simplified, modified, adjusted gross income uh, calculation, same that will be used on the, uh, in the exchange for the premium tax credit. Kids will be covered wherever they are at their state um, a chip and Medicaid levels as of date of enactment. So that'll vary by state. And as Robin pointed out, the average is 245. So we are getting rid of those, I, I overstate that. We're not getting rid of the categories, we're setting a uniform floor across the country. If a state wants to cover people in Medicaid above that floor, they still have the use of those categories to do, to do so. And many will, particularly for people with disabilities and people who need long-term care. The other way in which it really need to think of the world is fundamentally different, and it goes back to the three-legged stool, is that really, it, come 2014, it's, it, you have a subsidy system now available for people who don't have affordable coverage through the employer system um, that goes from 0% to poverty to 400% to poverty. There's no longer going to be that cliff for the individual who becomes eligible for Medicaid, gets a new job, or gets a raise in their job, and then they have no eligibility uh, for affordable care if that employer doesn't provide it. So the system anticipates that we will have a continual way of providing in affordable coverage for, for people, and it is up to us um, to make that system real for families so that really it flows in that kind of um, seamless way. The first steps that we've taken really to begin, begin on the implementation um, for 2014 has related to building IT systems. And while you probably haven't, it's not usually the first guidance that somebody looking at the Medicaid program will turn to is their IT version 1.0. Uh, it's a page turner. Um, but it gives you, along with a couple of other things we issued at the same time last uh, end of October and November, it gives you a sense of the system that we're beginning to um, uh, pull together with states that really takes us to a new world. We are anticipating that there will be seamlessness and coordination between the exchange and Medicaid and, uh, and CHIP. Um, and our systems will be developed to support that, and we have put more federal dollars on the table to help ensure that that happens. Um, we can't, of course, think about 2014 without thinking about um, the issue of who pays for, um, did I skip a slide? No, just a little different in my packet. Who pays for coverage? Overall, the coverage expansions in Medicaid are the cost is borne by the federal government, 95%. Isn't to say that that 5% isn't a significant lift for states. Of course it is, and especially feels that way now, given the difficult circumstances states are, states find themselves in. There are other parts of the law that for some states find themselves seeing that, that the law will um, save them additional dollars because of other offsets in the law that we can go into but I'm feeling the pressure of the time uh, constraint. So let me turn to the current fiscal pressures. Um, and, and, and it really follows, I think, what, what Robin said, but let me try and put it into three key points. Um, enrollment among families and children has grown sharply during the recession. That, I would argue, and I hope none of us would disagree, is a good thing. Medicaid is intended to be countercyclical. It is intended to, as poverty grows, as people lose jobs, as people lose their health insurance coverage and are within the income eligibility bands of Medicaid, they are supposed to be able to enroll in the program and get coverage that way. And so it had functioned as it's intended. The problem, of course, is that that countercyclical function runs counter to state finances, which is at the time of a recession, they are in the least, uh, least suited position to be able to sustain that enrollment growth. Hence, the Recovery Act came in and helped states with paying for that enrollment growth. But the rub is, of course, that um, that recovery, those recovery dollars, will end in June, uh, June 30th uh, of this year, and we are still 
with that enrollment growth. So we have enrollment growth. It's what was intended. It's what was anticipated. It is difficult for states to be able to handle without additional federal dollars, and that's the situation they'll find themselves in July 1st. Um, however, what really drives Medicaid costs, that's been the change that's gone on for the last couple of uh, years because of the recession, but underlying, if you dissect the Medicaid pro program and look at what's driving costs, you see, um, although this graph isn't that easy for folks to see from the screen, you see that our spending in Medicaid is highly skewed. 1% of beneficiaries account for 25% of the costs. 5% of beneficiaries account for 54% of the cost. Conversely, 5% of the beneficiaries, the 5% of beneficiaries that spend the least, uh, I'm sorry, the 50% of beneficiaries that spend, that, that, that spend the least, they only account for 5% of the cost. So yes, enrollment growth has gone up. Enrollment growth is the delta that states are dealing with. But fundamentally, if we want to deal with today and most importantly in the future of sustainability of the Medicaid program, we need to look at the cost drivers, and they are not surprisingly the same cost drivers that we see in the system as a whole. We are committed to look at those cost drivers. This is our formulation at CMS. We are looking at pe trying to improve people's experience of care. We are trying to, with other partners, improve population health, and we strongly believe that in doing so we can bring down per per person costs. Um, so we have reached out to states. The gov uh, secretary has reached out to governors in particular. Um, we are open for business in terms of new ideas, old ideas, sharing ideas. We've started some state-specific teams we call um, MSTATs, Medicaid um, State Technical Assistance Teams. We now have 17 states we're working very closely with, again, to think about what's on their plate, how can we help them given their unique circumstances, and how do we focus on the cost drivers. And just to give you a, a sense of, of the balance of why we're looking at these issues, in Medicaid, a study not, not done by us um, showed, and it's not different, much different than actually in Medicare or in private insurance, about 16% of, this was looking at Medicaid beneficiaries who are disabled, 16% who were discharged from the hospital found themselves back into the hospital within 30 days. Pretty typical, unfortunately, of our healthcare system. And 50% of those Medicare, Medicaid beneficiaries who found themselves back in the hospital within 30 days, these are disabled people, not people who like it's a surprise they have a medical problem. They didn't see, they didn't, had no primary care um, connection between the discharge and the readmission. There are things we can and must do to improve care, integrate care, make sure there's good handoffs at hospital discharge and so forth, that the community system is there for folks. If we, if we avoided one hospital readmission for one disabled Medicaid beneficiary, we are paying the cost that exceeds the cost of covering a parent on Medicaid for a year. Okay? We need to look at the cost drivers, and then we will be able to uh, move forward. So um, I'll just close, because uh, we're losing time here, just by um, we're trying to come up with ways to explain uh, that Medicaid is changing. Um, uh, what I've been saying, although I sometimes get criticized for this by the elder community, um, is that um, it won't be your grandmother's Medicaid program come 2014. Um, and, uh, but your grandmother may well be enrolled in Medicaid and get her benefits from the Medicaid program because we do are the primary payer for long-term care. So I'm really thrilled that you're all here to hear about Medicaid and to get this primer about it. Um, and I urge you to stay tuned because it's going to be changing and you want to keep up with the times. So thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Cindy. Uh, we've been hearing about Andy Allison for the first couple of presentations. Now we'll hear from him. He is the executive director of the Kansas Health Policy Authority, which puts him in charge, among other things, of the state's Medicaid and CHIP and state employee health plans. Uh, Andy also happens to be the president of the National Association of Medicaid Directors. So he knows the real world problems of his state in Medicaid. Here's directly from his peers about their real world problems and also about the good stuff. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Ed, and uh, Cindy and Robin. Terrific uh, introductions, Barbara. Uh, and I just have to give a, a, my own shout out to Cindy, uh, and I'll just point right to the uh, information systems issue, uh, which I think does help to 
bring Medicaid forward in time. It's a, it's a program that uh, Kansas has taken advantage of uh, and uh, really was the first step, and so I applaud CMS's effort to, uh, to put that high on the list. Uh, I'm going to have a little different presentation, and I, I hope I can get through uh, most of it. I'll probably skip some of this, so just consider it reference material and, or uh, fodder for questions. Uh, let me start with a – which one would I do? This one? Yes. Right. Let me start with a working definition of Medicaid from a state's point of view. This is really a two-page issue. Medicaid is an optional source of matching funds for – uh, states wishing to, wishing to purchase health care for uh, selected populations. Uh, I don't think of it first as an insurance product because states define the way they purchase that health care in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's hard to opt out. No state has done it yet. Uh, that may become an issue, uh, but no state has opted out. Too much money involved. Uh, it's run by states, and this is an old slide, over half the program in just about every state, certainly on average, certainly in Kansas, used to be optional. That's not true right now because of the uh, requirement of the Affordable Care Act to maintain your program. I'm not sure what percentage to put on it right now. That's obviously an issue that states are working with uh, the administration uh, to address. Another definition, here's more of a statement of purpose. It's the use of state and federal matching funds to meet the state's greatest health needs. Why do I say this? Because many states are considering or are planning to use uh, federal matching dollars in one form or another. It might be the administrative dollars to do things like promote health information exchange or to use payment reforms in Medicaid or potentially their state employee plan to drive change in the marketplace. So when Cindy points out that uh, change in Medicaid might either be dovetailed or even help lead change in your health care system, that's true. And just imagine when Medicaid gets bigger and is a bigger piece of most uh, providers' uh, payer mix uh, and revenue, that lever becomes a lot bigger and at least presents that choice to states to drive health systems uh, improvement through Medicaid. Uh, that is uh, something to consider. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, the Affordable Care Act, because I want to get to the last uh, section of the presentation, but uh, we did do estimates pretty early on of the uh, potential impact of uh, the Affordable Care Act on Kansas. Uh, probably would change a few things today, but I, I did at least want to share these with you. I think it's important for states to do this and for uh, Congress uh, to understand the very different impact that health reform or any change you would make in Medicaid could have on different states because they start from radically different uh, baselines, uh, and I mean both dollars and uh, program impact. So this just demonstrates to you that we did do an estimate. It was a comprehensive estimate, not just for what would happen in Medicaid, but what will uh, happen in the small employer market and the large employer market. Um, one you know, small point is if you look at an estimate of the impact on health reform on a state, if it doesn't include the rest of these, I would suggest to you uh, that it needs to. Uh, because they're missing, in part, one of the points Cindy made is uh, we're going to have 11,000, Kansas is a relatively small program, we'll have 11 or 12,000 people who are enrolled in uh, their employer, but Medicaid's helping to buy them in. Uh, if you don't look at employer coverage when you're estimating the cost of Medicaid, you're going to count all of those dollars against your Medicaid program, and you're not going to pick up uh, the employer contribution. So that's just one example of why uh, you, you, you want to do a better job uh, and be careful when you're looking at the state impact. Here's the other. This is my answer to the question, at least last May, of the impact of health reform on Kansas. It's that number. Well, there are nine of them. Why did, why did I give you nine of them? It's actually choices, okay? Uh, you can't answer the question with a single number unless you're going to predict the policy choices that states will make as they implement the bill, for example, Will you maintain all of the, in many cases, state-only spending on uh, safety net programs for the uninsured, uh, like health clinic spending? Are you going to maintain that if all the people that go to your health clinic are eligible for Medicaid and are being paid fee-for-service at, by the way, 100% of their cost uh, for those services? Are you going to double pay for the uninsured uh, once everyone's enrolled if you're successful in getting them enrolled? That's a choice that states will have to make. Some states might choose to just pay once. 
Uh, and so those are the columns that you see if you cut Medicaid spending, or I'm sorry, non-Medicaid spending on the safety net in half, if you eliminated it altogether, if you didn't cut it at all. The other issue is, uh, what will it take to buy you in as a Medicaid program uh, to the physician's office or to the dentist's office? Let me rephrase that. I'm not sure there is enough money to buy you into a dentist's office in a Medicaid program, but let's stick with docs. Um, how much would it take? Are you going to have to raise rates? Uh, that's a conversation into itself. That's the row that you see. But I just want to leave you with the concept. It is not a simple answer. And in fact, it's dependent on policy choices that states will make and obviously on implementation decisions that the federal government is making. Now for the real story, which is between now and then, although this slide is, is over the next nine years. So if, and what I showed you before was the annual net cost of the bill in Medicaid. So anywhere from negative 40 to positive $40 million state general fund, point estimate right in the middle of that. Uh, in 2020, after the match rate comes back down to 90% for the, or 10% for the uh, state, uh, for the expansion. Now, what's happening to the baseline Medicaid program in that time? Huge growth. That's $320 million. I tried to take inflation out of it. That just gets you a sense. And the little, uh, I'm sorry, the little sliver that you can't hardly see at the top, the $4 million, that's the impact of the health reform bill. The rest of it's what happens because of growth in the number of aged and disabled and per person costs. That just is uh, hopefully dramatically reinforcing what uh, Cindy just pointed out. There's a whole lot to do to implement the bill. Again, commending Cindy for the first steps that are taken. If your state's not racing, they're behind. Uh, I'll just put it that way. So uh, where are we today in Medicaid programs? Uh, I can't give you a single answer because there are 50 states. And not every state is at the same point along this path that I'm going to, uh, in, in, in the picture I'm going to paint for you. You've seen a lot of pictures of the economy. This is the one I want to start with. It's the percentage of the US population that is employed. And what you will see is that we have just lost essentially a full generation's worth of growth in labor market participation in this country versus the whole population, an entire generation's growth. We're going back 25 years or more. That's what's happened to our employment base. And it's relevant in Medicaid because you're looking at that numerator denominator, you're looking at both the revenue source for states in employment, the denominator is the growth in spending because you're looking at population, you're looking at aging. Those, the population's going to grow, Medicaid's going to grow, or its costs are. That is, to me, a clearer picture of the future of Medicaid if we don't, if we don't address it. Uh, the other, you've already heard it here, is Medicaid growing because of the recession? Not unless we've been in recession since the day Medicaid was created, no. No. Okay, you don't see one year since 1966, the year I was born, by the way, that Medicaid has shrunk as a percentage of this nation's annual income, except the year that they transferred part of it to Medicare with Part D in the drug, in the drug benefit. The only year that it shrunk. Okay, this is not about recessions. This is our state. Not every state would look the same. And you've heard this. This is the last five years of growth broken out by population. And what you're seeing is first aged, pretty flat. Then you're seeing growth. This is total dollars in Medicaid spending on disabled population. And then the children and families, the poverty level group. So it's that third group that really grows with health reform. But where's the growth in Medicaid? At least in Kansas, dramatically so. It's in the aged, and particular, it's not the aged, it's really the disabled. That's where the growth is. Now, if you project that forward and you don't change your program, you get a picture that looks like this. The number that starts on the bottom is total spending, and you're looking at, we're only projecting 7.4% growth. You're looking at a structural deficit of enormous proportions, at least in Kansas, because revenue is not there. Revenue just changed permanently down in its growth path. It's no longer even on uh, that scale. We've got a problem, uh, and it's rapidly approaching. Uh, one of the things that states, and Cindy again has already pointed out, uh, if you're going to address Medicaid spending, you're going to have to see, you always start with the big numbers in a management 
challenge. So this is just a picture of where the big numbers are in Kansas program. And I've uh, shaded in dark shade uh, the big issues. And it's medical spending for kids and families for the disabled at about equal levels. And then you see home and community-based services uh, and then nursing facilities. So if you're going to address spending, you have to address those big buckets. And most of the big buckets are really with the disabled uh, and the aging. And one of the dynamics that you're seeing at the state level is attempts to, instead of organizing, purchasing across populations by service type, organizing spending uh, or uh, the purchase of care across service types within a population, a health home. What if you had a health home for the disabled? Well, look how bifurcated the spending is. How do you get the circle of purchasing around both medical care and uh, the other components? So uh, hopefully I've given you, there's the, the rest is there just for your reference and for questions later. Hopefully I've given you a sense of where Medicaid is, at least in Kansas. Not every state's in the same revenue predicament. I would argue, though, with disabled being driven by enrollment in Social Security at the federal level in large part, uh, I hope I've given you at least one representative view of, of where we might be headed. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Can we pass the clicker down there? Our final speaker is uh, Ron Haskins, if I can give you your tool there. Uh, Ron co-directs the Center on Children and Families at the Brookings Institution. Uh, in an earlier life, he spent 14 years uh, on the Republican staff of the House Ways and Means Committee. He was a senior welfare uh, advisor on welfare policy to President George W. Bush in 2002. Uh, when he was at the Ways and Means Committee, he was the editor of the Green Book. And if you haven't seen the Green Book, you've really missed out. Uh, it's the most... It, was the most useful publication on Capitol Hill for Don't decades. want to drop it on your toe, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for editing it all those years, and uh, uh, thank you for being with us. We've asked Ron to, to take a look at what some areas of potential uh, concern about Medicaid in the future might be, and you foolishly agreed to do that, so thanks very much. Well, thank you. It's good to be up here, uh, hanging out at Brookings with a bunch of old white guys. And it's real nice to come up to the hill and be with young people who look, walk straight and are wide awake and everything. So, uh, and I, I would like to give you a little advice. Uh, if you look down there at Andy at the far end of the table, he looks like about a middle-aged guy that's in good health. Actually, he's only 24 years old. He has gray hair. He doesn't walk straight. He gets about two or three hours sleep a night, and there are two main reasons. Here's how he spends his day. First, he gets calls from Cindy and other federal officials asking him why this group of 1,000 has not been covered by the Kansas Medicaid program. And then between those phone calls, he goes into the governor's office, and the governor yells and screams at him because he's ruining the state budget. So my advice to you young people is do not grow up to be state Medicaid directors. <clears throat> All right, I'm not much of a Medicaid guy myself. I took my own advice. Uh, but Medicaid impinges on issues that I'm extremely interested in, and in particular, four things. So here is the first one, if I can. Uh, this is an old chart. I've been trying for three years to get CBO to upgrade this chart, and I think they're going to do it. But it still makes the point. Uh, I want to direct your attention especially to the growth of here's, here's, here's what would have happened in 1999 if none of the laws had changed after 1984 in work supports. Now, work support is a very big story. And any of you interested in low-income families, I think it's the number one story of domestic social policy for, say, the last 10 or 15 years. And that is because Congress has deliber deliberately created a system where people who leave welfare and work, even at low-wage job jobs, those lousy hamburger-flipping jobs that people talk about, will leave poverty, and they'll be much better off than if they'd been on welfare. And the reason is that the federal and state government, governments really subsidize them. In fact, if in 1999, after the Welfare Reform Bill and a huge outburst of employment, especially by low-income mothers, we would have spent only $5.8 billion supporting that group of uh, families. But because of all the changes in these various laws here after 1984, in fact, 
CBO estimated we would spend $52 billion. That is a revolution. That's a work uh, support revolution. And it's much bigger today. We are providing much more support for low-income working families than we did even when this was done. And a big part of that support and a growing part of the support is S-CHIP and Medicaid, as you can see here. If you add, if you, in your mind, you could add the purple and this whatever color you call that, I guess it's a red skin color, and compare it to that, that's how much it's expanded. And it's expanded way more than that since then. So this is the first thing about Medicaid. Under the old system, say roughly before 1996 or so, 1997, we used to have to worry about the incentive to work because there were a lot of disincentives. For one thing, if you did the right thing and left welfare and went to work, you lost your Medicaid coverage. And so did your children. So once that problem was repaired, and it was repaired primarily by Mr. Waxman, uh, and mostly under bipartisan legislation, a whole series of legislation that covered kids completely outside welfare, never mind if their parents on welfare, if they met the income criterion, the kids were covered. As has been pointed out previously, we didn't do as good a job with mothers, uh, but those Waxman reforms were very important. And then in 1997, again on a bipartisan basis, uh, we passed the S-CHIP law, which covered millions of kids, and that's the second reason that we have these great coverages outside the welfare system, and we've dramatically increased the incentive to work. And now the third step is the Affordable Care Act, when presumably not only the kids but the mothers will be covered, and so we'll have even more work incentive for mothers and even fewer excuses for low-income families not to work, even if the jobs pay low wages. So the first point I want to make to you is that Medicaid is really a vital part of our work support system. It has had immense effect on the country as a whole. Do you realize that today, after the worst recession we've had since the Great Depression, never married mothers are still more likely to work than they were before welfare reform, even after their employment has gone down for four of the last six years. And that for kids in female-headed families, they're less likely to be poor than they were before welfare reform, even now after several years of increase in child poverty. So it's, this is a very big deal. It's one of the most, in my view, one of the most important parts of Medicaid is, the, is its implication in the work support system. Uh, the second thing uh, is that, the, that uh, Medicaid plays a vital role during recessions. We've talked about that a little bit already. I think two people have mentioned it. If you see here during the recession of 2001, we get this nice increase in Medicaid. And after the recent recession, uh, we get an even bigger increase in Medicaid. So Medicaid is doing exactly what a good safety net program is supposed to do. When people lose their jobs, they have lower income, they automatically qualify, they get the benefit because it's entitlement. So it is one of our most effective, along with unemployment insurance and food stamps, it's our most effective safety net programs. And in fact, our safety net programs are so good, you never read this in the paper, do you know that during this horrible recession that we've had, child poverty did not go up? And it did not go up, even though families had less earnings, it didn't go up because federal programs leaped in there to fill the gap. And if Medicaid hadn't done that, that would be a real problem. We'd have a lot more kids and a lot more parents that did not have health and coverage. They'd have to try to get in emergency rooms. Uh, and Annie can tell you what it's like to try to cover uh, uh, care in emergency rooms doesn't work very well. So again, Medicaid is an essential part of the American uh, system of social policy because of its effectiveness during recessions. And then something that very, very, very few people talk about is the impact on inequality. I'm an avid reader of the New York Times and the Washington Post, and I'm going to make a rough guess that the ratio of stories that bemoan how horrible inequality is in the United States and how it's exploded in recent years is that, as compared with, oh, wait, the government did a lot to offset inequality. It's got to be at least 10 to 1. You hardly ever read anything good about inequality uh, in America, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and many other publications as well. Well, look at these numbers right here. Here is, here's what happens to people uh, in the bottom 20%. So roughly speaking, these are families below $22,000, $23,000 a year. Before government transfers, they, between 1997 and 2007, their income actually declined. So life in the state of nature, so to speak, before any government help got worse. But once we had government transfers like food stamps and other uh, programs, they actually are better off by 9.5% over this period when the New York Times and Washington Post 
will tell you that their well-being declined. And now if we add the tax transfers, especially the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, which provide billions of dollars, the EITC is almost $50 billion now, targeted exclusively on low-income families, then their income improved by 15%. And then if we do something that hardly anybody ever does, add the value of health insurance, especially Medicaid, some Medicare in here, but mostly Medicaid, they are better off 26.4% if you just count the dollars. So Medicaid and Medicare does the same thing. These programs play a dramatic effect in improving our inequality picture in the United States. And in fact, for the elderly, for people over age 65, if you look at the bottom 20%, they, the value of the health care that they get from Medicare and Medicaid is about 165% of their income. It's even greater than their income. So the government does a lot. Our health insurance programs are a crucial part of that to combat inequality, and Medicaid, if anything, is at least as important as Medicare. So for these three reasons, Medicaid is truly an important program for someone who's interested in poverty and well-being and opportunity in America. So now let me conclude with the other side of the story. There was a great economist at the American Enterprise Institute right here in Washington, D.C., named Herm Stein, and he had a profound idea. He said, any trend that can't continue won't. And that's what I want to talk about right now for about one minute. Any trend that can't continue won't. It's our spending on health care. It cannot continue. It will not continue. The crunch is coming. I've sat through a million presentations on the Hill, and I, Cindy Mann's an old friend of mine. I love her to death. But, and she's talking about cost containment. So far, nothing works very well. The marginal effects, maybe. Keep it up. I'm glad you're doing it. The states are not going to be able to do it. All the state Medicaid directors are going to die of heart attacks. We just cannot keep this up. And the choices are limited. Look at this. I've got 100 slides like this if you want to see more. Eventually, we spend, you know, something like half of our GDP on health care. It ain't going to happen, especially because we're going to have to at some point raise taxes. Do that or Chinese are going to own the whole country. So it won't continue. Andy, there's a block grant in your future. Congress is going to pass the buck to the states eventually. I mean, they might not do it this year. They might not do it next year, but they're going to do it. And what they're going to do is give a fixed amount of money to the states, none of this open-ended entitlement stuff, and they're going to say, you figure it out. We very nearly did that once in 1996, and even the governors were willing to do it if they got enough flexibility. Uh, it did not happen then, I think, in my view, fortunately. But it's coming. And when that happens, these wonderful coverages that you've heard about here and the great expansions and all the terrific things that happen to low-income people because they're covered by Medicaid, it's going to be a new story. I don't think anybody knows what the outcome will be, but it's coming for sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, presumably, you don't know everything about the Medicaid program, or didn't when you came in. Now you know a lot more. To the extent that you have other questions that have not yet been addressed, or would like to clarify something that you heard, now's the chance uh, for you to step forward and try to draw on our experts to get that clarified. Um, there are microphones on either side of the room. There are green question cards in your packets. If you want to write a question and hold it up, someone will bring it forward. And uh, you, should, uh, you should not shy away from asking the simplest question. This is, after all, a primer. But you've got people up here who can answer the most sophisticated questions as well. So it's wide open. We'd ask that you identify yourself and be as brief as you can in asking your question. Um, hi, Sarah Cliff with Politico. Thank you for putting this on. Um, a question mostly, I think, for Cindy and Andy. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the MSTAT program, how it's going, you know, these states reaching out to you, you reaching out to them, um, any of them run by Republican governors, and kind of what solutions you all are talking through on um, kind of these cost control issues. Um, it's, you know, first of all, I would say that we like to think um, that we're 
always working in partnership with states. Um, what we've done through the MSTAT initiative is to be very explicit, um, very uh, hopefully very nimble, and very available to states. So uh, we have at this point um, in our official MSTAT roster, we have 17 states that have asked us to sit down with them. We think it's you know, the, the most effective way of, of working because as, as, as has been said many times, every state's unique. Um, so it allows us to really hear directly from, from the state what they're grappling with, what their particular cost drivers are, um, and, and how we can be of assistance. So it has ranged from you know, sitting through uh, in New York, um, the, um, the deliberations that they've done on the Medicaid Reform Commission um, that people have probably read about, um, to having very small one-on-one -on -one meetings um, in, in you know, a state conference room. Um, so, and as you might imagine, and we've got a variety of kinds of requests that are before us. Um, people, states looking to uh, expand managed care to populations they haven't put into managed care before for services they haven't put into managed care before, for example, on long-term care. Um, that's an initiative that we think um, makes a lot of sense to look at. We've talking to people about uh, trying to blend uh, behavioral health, mental health services, and physical health services. That integrated care need um, seems uh, it doesn't always happen uh, in the uh, the worlds of mental health and physical health. So there's a, quite a variety of different things that are coming before us, and uh, we think it'll continue and continue to grow. We've gotten new requests every week. Andy, you want to add to that? Uh, I would just add that uh, I think that CMS is doing the right thing. Uh, you know, Cindy came uh, and talked to the Medicaid directors uh, as I think they were considering the next steps for states that were facing financial difficulty. Uh, and, you know, given Ron's comment and certainly the uh, indications we've heard from uh, at least a few states around the country, if you're going to consider the larger scale change in Medicaid, then more than likely you first have to run down the issue of what's possible within the current structure. And so one way to look at the MSTAT process is, you know, what is possible within Title 19 and Title 21, looking ahead to the Affordable Care, what, are, what is possible uh, uh, for states that are facing, uh, at, various, at, at various rates, are approaching this structural deficit that we're pointing to in, in really a very large scale. So, uh, you know, it's very early, so we don't have returns yet from states. I'm sure Cindy doesn't either. Uh, uh, but it's, it's the kind of effort that needs to take place. Very good. We have a number of people lined up with questions, and let me just take a second to ask those of you who are associated with congressional offices. We were unable to arrange, uh, because of the physical uh, attributes of this room, for a, a live webcast to which we could have uh, invited your colleagues in state and district offices to tune in. And so when we do the webcast that's archived, we're going we're gonna to reach out to those folks, let them know that they can take a look at this program's webcast, and we'd like to be able even to let them ask questions, which we can perhaps get some of our panelists to answer after the fact if they're not answered uh, in, in, or if they're not answerable by uh, the mere mortals at the Alliance. Uh, and maybe you could encourage them to uh, participate. We've got a series of these primers, as, as Barbara was noting, uh, coming up, including one next week on Medicare. So you should, let, if you could, let them know that uh, uh, this might be something that's worth their spending time on. Um, we'd very much appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, my name is Brian Blaze uh, from the Heritage Foundation. And when I was trying to learn about Medicaid, I went to Amazon.com and typed in Medicaid. And seven of the top 10 books that came back dealt with Medicaid estate planning, basically this technique where you know, attorneys write books that advise clients on how to qualify for Medicaid by artificially impoverishing themselves, by taking advantage of spend down requirements. And I was in New York actually talking to eligibility workers and one of them was exacer exacerbated, and she said, you know, occasionally we still get a poor person on Medicaid for long-term care services. And I was wondering if you could comment on, comment on that and whether that's a serious way of tightening eligibility 
for the nursing home entitlement component of Medicaid as a way for states and the federal government to save a substantial amount of money. Thank you. Robin, you want to take a first crack at that? <laughs> or not? <laughs> Andrew? I, you know, we, we know these attorneys, several of them are uh, on the opposite side of a courtroom from Kansas uh, at any given moment. Um, and, and, you know, think of Medicaid eligibility rules in some sense as a tax code. And, you know, the IRS can't, and, and congressional tax committees can't ever stop looking for the next shelter. Uh, and, and that's certainly true in our relationship with, uh, you know, with, with the community that that needs very expensive long-term care. So that's, it's a significant issue and a number of states are, uh, are uh, looking at options uh, to address that. And the immediate constraint and question is whether those changes can or cannot be made given the Affordable Care Act's requirement that may, the eligibility rules be maintained. Well, if you stopped uh, maintaining the tax code and didn't update it for the next shelter, you can imagine what would happen. It doesn't take very long in some cases. So uh, that's an area of interest for states. Barbara? Oh, I was just going to uh, point out that the rules around um, qualifying for long-term care were changed recently in the 2005 DRA, where um, the rules were tightened up and the look-back period for asset transfers was, uh, was shortened, um, and some new rules around um, home equity were put into place. Um, and the other thing I would just mention is that it, we should be clear that when someone um, does qualify for nursing home care, um, they are required to put their, um, their income, if they have a Social Security check or whatever, um, towards the cost of that care, um, and then Medicaid fills in the difference. Um, they're allowed to keep a small personal allowance, but the bulk of their income does go towards the cost of, of that care. Cindy? Yeah, I was just gonna mention the DR, oh, thank you, Ron. The DRA changes, um, so there are, you know, there'll always be, um, there'll always be loopholes, there'll always be lawyers, I'm one looking, at, I'm not one of the ones looking for loopholes, but um, uh, looking for ways to, for people to qualify, but the rules um, have been significantly tightened. And the other thing to think about is that in this country right now, there is no, um, there's, there's no source of, of payment for long-term care um, costs. Um, private insurance is generally not there for people. And um, if you are uh, in long-term care for any length of time, even if you have modest income um, at the time you started, you're likely not to have uh, much income uh, or assets over time. So we have a broader long-term care problem to, to address in this country, and it is a very important problem to address for the Medicaid program. Uh, but it's not just you know, people doing loopholes, it's the fact that we don't have a good financing mechanism right now. Medicaid, therefore, um, has become that financing mechanism by default. Uh, it's a very important issue. I mean, we, we in the Medicaid program, and we haven't really focused on this um, uh, sufficiently, I think, in this uh, today, we, four out of every uh, $10 in the Medicaid program is spent on Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare essentially does not cover long-term care. Um, clearly, we would understand that many people on Medicare will need long-term care. Medicaid picks that up. Um, it is a big source of cost for the Medicaid program, and so some of the, not, uh, the broader issue of long-term care financing, the broader issue of Medicaid's role for Medicare um, benefit gaps um, are very important if we're going to look at that uh, structural deficit that, that Andy talks about. Okay. Yes, sir. Chris Jacobs with the Republican Policy Committee. A couple of technical questions, but bear with me. Uh, first, I wanted to ask Cindy, what's the status of the uh, impending Medicaid regulation regarding provider reimbursement rates? I stumbled across a um, Supreme Court filing from last December in the Maxwell Jolly case where uh, the Justice Department said that HHS was planning to release a proposed rule on Medicaid provider reimbursements next month with a final rule by the end of the year. Um, I talked with some of my colleagues on the Hill who didn't know about this, and I don't know whether Dr. Allison knows about this or not. We've heard a lot in the past week or so, you know, the president saying state flexibility, 
but I think a lot of governors might be concerned if there's a rulemaking process that could suddenly slap them with another unfunded mandate in terms of setting some kind of floor or threshold for Medicaid uh, provider reimbursements. Obviously, it's an issue that limits access, but it's also really one of the only tools that states have at this point or to manage their Medicaid program. So that's, that's kind of my first question. What's the status of that? My second question involves the definition of MAGI. Uh, there was a footnote in Rick Foster's testimony before the House Budget Committee a couple of weeks ago where he said that excluding Social Security benefits from the MAGI threshold, which he at least implied was the correct statutory interpretation, would mean that the CMS actuary estimates of Medicaid coverage were understated by 5 million or more beneficiaries. Uh, and it's my understanding that CBO also did not exclude Social Security benefits from the MAGI threshold. Um, the number up there, the $21.1 billion from the Kaiser Urban Study, uh, does not exclude Social Security benefits from the MAGI threshold. If you did that, more, C more early retirees, more beneficiaries would be enrolled in Medicaid as opposed to exchange subsidies, and the unfunded mandate costs to the states would be appreciably higher. Um, so I don't know, is CMS planning to put out guidance on this or regulations at this point, because this is not a rounding error. This is a five million or more population. You're talking about unfunded mandates to the billions or te tens of billions of dollars in the out years budgetarily, and I think states need some certainty what's going on and may end up that, that this Kaiser survey on the 21 billion and some of the other state estimates have actually underestimated because of this very important definition on the MAGI threshold. And in the interest of recognizing that this is a primer. <laughs> <laughs> I said they were technical when I started. Why don't you start by telling some of us, anyway, what M-A-G-I stands for. It's, it's the Modified Adjusted Gross Income, and because it goes off the definition in the Internal Revenue Code, that apparently the Internal Revenue Code definition excludes Social Security benefits, which means anybody who retires at age 62 and takes early Social Security, they may not have outside income. If their only income is Social Security, they won't go into the exchange, at least if this is the interpretation, they will go on to Medicaid. Um, and that's, that's something that will impact the Medicaid program. And frankly, some, some early retirees won't, won't decide to retire. It, it may not impact job lock because some 62-year-olds may not want to go on to Medicaid. Because of access? Because of access. Then maybe we should do access <laughs> Well, which is, uh, that's my first start, question. That's where I was going, yep. Um, let me start by the first. Um, you're, you're, a, you're an avid reader. Um, uh, it's amazing what you find when you read the footnotes. Well, it, it, in terms of the regulatory, we also put out a list of what regs we plan to issue each mm -hmm. year, and these access regs have also been on our list of, of regulatory, uh, of, of what regs we expect to issue during the year. So. Um, uh, we publish that um, every year we update it periodically um, during the year so we have committed to issue uh, regs on the on the provision of Medicaid law around access um, I, and Andy Andy knows full full well about them and we're um, working with a number of stakeholders to talk about the regulations we've had a couple of governors actually ask us for regulations we have a situation now where as states are uh, changing their payment rates for providers. There's been a fair amount of litigation. Um, uh, as you noted, there's a case before, at, at, in front of the Supreme Court. And um, states find, um, and we would agree that being um, having those rules the subject of different court decisions at different times um, is not a, a good and predictable and thoughtful way to run a program. Uh, so we uh, I think collectively agree, probably not every state would agree, but that um, having some uh, uh, transparent and uh, across the board rules about how we look at access, how states should look at access, what the public process ought to be, what the data sources ought to be will help um, provide some consistency to how states can administer the program. 
In terms of the MAGI, there's a lot of changes in MAGI. First of all, I should say that there's a big debate as to whether it's MAGI or it's MAGI or MAGI. So, um, th um, so um, <laughs> the IRS, who thinks it belongs to them, and it has in the past, really shudder at the thought of um, MAGI. Um, they think it's MAGI. Um, so we. we Guard them as the experts in this. There's a lot of changes in the income definition that MAGI represents, and it's there's a there's an up and down um, in terms of how Medicaid is considered now. So you have there are, there is an issue around Social Security benefits um, would affect more uh, you know a small number of people since MAGI in Medicaid only affects people 65 and younger. Um, the Medicaid rules do not change for, uh, we don't adopt the MAGI definitions for 65 and older. So it, there's, there's ups and downs, there's a lot of changes, that's uh, why I spend a lot of time with my IRS and Treasury friends, is the point of the uh, Affordable Care Act is to have one consistent definition across the exchange and Medicaid so that people don't uh, uh, bounce back and forth and get different answers depending upon uh, what what coverage source they apply for so uh, but, but do you know I mean it's it is five million people at least that's what the Medicare actuary says and that's you'd have you know, to talk to the actuaries about but, the estimate but do you know when there's going to be any oh, clarity yes. from CMS on this yeah, we're, in terms of, in terms we're, we're out issuing, the regs and, 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 as, as, and as noted um, before, in terms of our uh, projection on uh, regulations promulgation, this year is when we're going to be issuing regulations, us, uh, the OSOSIO, and uh, the Treasury. We plan to issue regulations on MAGI and some of those definitions. They will be proposed regulations. Uh, there will be plenty of opportunity for thought and comment before they go into any final rule. I think we're over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Brooke Bell. In, in contrast to the last question, I'll probably ask you an overly simplified one. But um, after PPACA and going forward, what is the future of the CHIP program? Um, I know there's additional funding and additional um, eligibility um, requirements or more people will be eligible. But going forward, what's if you could kind of read the tea leaves for me. Well, I won't read the tea leaves necessarily, but I'll at least tell you what's in the law, um, and then others might want to read some tea leaves. So uh, the, the Affordable Care Act maintains the CHIP program, continues it through 2019, um, September 30th, 2019. The funding actually is extended for, uh, under CHIPRA, the, the law that preceded the Affordable Care Act that renewed CHIP program had um, extended funding to CHIP through 2013. The Affordable Care Act moves that to 2015. Um, and if, if funding still exists uh, for the program, obviously it's up to a future Congress, the Affordable Care Act also ups the match rate for states uh, an additional 23 percentage points. So the average match rate for states right now in CHIP is 70%, meaning states pay 30 cents on the dollar, states pay 70 cents on the dollar um, under the... Uh, the feds pay, thank you, Ed. The feds pay 70 cents on the dollar under the Affordable Care Act change effect of 2016. It'll be 93 cents on the dollar on average paid by the feds. Uh, but it, it depends on what Congress does in terms of uh, extending the funding for the program after 2016. Doesn't, the law doesn't, doesn't expand eligibility for CHIP, though. I just want to make that clear. It, states can expand eligibility for CHIP if they choose to. What the law says is that the minimum uh, that states have to continue covering where they were on March 23rd, 2010. So it doesn't increase the eligibility levels relative to wherever a state was on enactment. And I'll just add a little bit to that, probably, again, oversimplified and, and not necessarily a prediction, but what Congress had to do or did, I suppose, in the Affordable Care Act is, is kick the question of CHIP down the road. Uh, they just punted. Uh, because the fundamental question is whether those kids end up with their parents in the exchange and private insurance. And there was a debate about that, and it just simply wasn't resolved. So. In the meantime, the feds essentially bought states out of the program or very close to it at the high, high match rate, if I can, again, oversimplify. So it's a, it is an unresolved question. I wouldn't predict the outcome. There is a practical dilemma for states who run up against their allotment, though, 
uh, which uh, and and you know run out of the sort of capped block grant funding that uh, that that Chip is now funded through. We're not sure exactly who or how we will turn kids away uh, once we run out of uh, sort of slots, no matter who's paying the bill. So I, I think there's some issues uh, going forward, but but may, maybe should or should not be resolved until after we've seen what the exchanges uh, look like, if, if they happen, uh, and what private insurance coverage looks like. That My best guess is that's what the political bargain was here, just wait and see what it looks like and then decide what to do with CHIP. And, and just going to that, one thing we hadn't talked about is a lot of states are thinking about, I know Andy is and other states, are thinking about um, how to uh, bring the same plans that are doing business on the exchange uh, to be doing business in CHIP and in Medicaid, maybe not completely, but substantially, in which case uh, the fact that a parent might be in the exchange and a ch child might be in CHIP, considering that we have smooth, seamless coordination at enrollment, um, which is the expectation, and that's the IT guidance and all, um, to the extent that plans are participating uh, uh, across the board, or there's a choice of plans that are participating across the board, then um, there, the, the difference ends up being be hopefully behind the scenes which pot of money is paying for the coverage. Hi, my name is Lizzie DeSantis, and I'm from Congressman Gus Pilarakis' office. Um, I had a question of specifically related to Medicaid fraud. Um, from what I've been reading, that's one of the things that drives Medicaid costs up so much. And I was wondering if there's anything in the Affordable Care Act specifically that works to um, counter that fraud, and if you all have any suggestions how to counter the fraud. Um, I know that in Florida they recently um, established a federal funding demonstration to try to do that. And and what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that will be effective? Um, there's uh, not that much. Uh, there's an oh, thank you again, Ron. There's an error rate in the Medicaid program, which is different than the than than fraud rate. Um, the last national error rate was about 9.5. Um, it's a you know erroneous payment. Sometimes it's lack of. Sometimes it's fraud. Sometimes it's lack of documentation from the provider or from the beneficiary. Um, and uh, it's a relatively new system for, for calculating it, so um, uh, hopefully the documentation problems will um, resolve themselves over time. Um, we have a pretty uh, aggressive uh, effort underway, I think both for Medicare, Medicaid, um, and for the CHIP program. Um, it's really been a very high priority of the administration and of the secretary, um, working both in, with private sector and public sector. Um, uh, there's a number of provisions in the Affordable Care Act. There's some, uh, there's some uh, checks around nursing homes and uh, providers. Um, there's provisions about if a provider's been uh, dropped from the Medicare program, that they have to be dropped from the Medicaid program, and we're making that information available to states um, so they uh, can, can accomplish that easily. I think I mentioned before that we were doing as part of, in conjunction with our MSTAT efforts, we're doing um, webinars with states on initiatives. Our, our second webinar, the one we had actually this week, was around program integrity. We have a program integrity institute, a Medicaid program integrity institute, where states come in. Sometimes states, often states are the, the teachers. Um, and we share best practices, uh, really honing in on uh, what everybody's learning, both across the Medicaid program across states, but also pulling in what we're learning and what we're developing in the Medicare program and making that available to states as we go forward. I, I, think, I, have, oh, sorry, I, I think I have to chip in at, at least this much. So we put out for bid last year uh, a recovery audit contract. It's a, you know, part, uh, it's a requirement. We were one of the probably first states to do it because our legislator, uh, legislature asked us uh, to, to go quickly uh, and to put out for bid a contract, and this was sort of the contract, go find all of that you can, and you get 17% of it. So guess what the bids were? Six million dollars over three years. State general fund, that's what we get back if they, if, if they actually uh, uh, find what they projected they would find, and we get 83, well, we get a, the state share of 83% of it. And you saw that our program is two point five billion dollars per year. We have to have a program with, that is operated with integrity. If taxpayers don't trust that 
payments are being made uh, for legitimate beneficiaries, for legitimate services under legitimate circumstances, they won't fund it. We have to have integrity. But if Congress thinks that we're going to get out of the structural deficit that we're facing by going after fraud and abuse in Medicaid anyway, I don't know the Medicare program, uh, I, I think they'd better take a second look. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jim Thompson. I'm a retired HHS employee. My uh, question relates to Robin's uh, third point, and uh, anyone on the panel can answer it. Uh, Medicaid increases access to care using private providers and has to pay for that care in the costly U.S. marketplace. And the latter part of this point is the costly U.S. marketplace. Since this is a primer, are, are there suggestions that you have as to other models? I know that some of the Alliance for Health Reform briefings in the past have suggest, suggested options to working with the costly U.S. marketplace. But anybody on the panel can answer this. Uh, are, there, are there options or models that, that we should be considering or states should be considering? Thank you. I do think that is an issue for another briefing, but the point I would just say of that comment is to recognize that Medicaid is purchasing um, care in this private marketplace. It is not, you know, this government-run program where it's um, contained, but Medicaid is buying services with private doctors, hospitals, managed care companies, and ultimately to reduce overall costs of Medicaid and Medicare, there need to be broader efforts in the overall health care system, and that just working on cost containment efforts within the Medicaid program is not going to be um, effective in, in ultimately reducing costs. Let me just let me just add. Uh, the factually, of course, that's exactly right. And uh, one of the uh, um, the new friends on the block um, at at CMS is our Innovation Center, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, uh, which was established by the Affordable Care Act, and it really is focused at ways um, for all payers, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, private payers, um, to think about you know to to test models and work on how to deliver care better and, and uh, with less costs. Um, and I think it's the leverage of the different payers together that really will give us the, the greatest opportunities to change those cost curves. Yeah, hi, my name's Brandon Clark. I'm a consultant with a few states. Um, I used to work on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Just a quick question. Uh, last week, uh, there was uh, some discussion at the White House about giving states increased flexibility. There was a lot of discussion about um, how that was Medicaid flexibility, and uh, the president referenced uh, Section 1332 of the bill, which is a state waiver for uh, innovation that allows the Section 1401 and 1402 funds to be sent to the, um, to the states as a block grant. Uh, however, that section uh, does not include Medicaid funds, does the president support uh, not only moving the effective date of that section from January 1st, 2017 up to January 1st, uh, 2014, uh, does he also support or does HHS or CMS uh, support including uh, Medicaid funds in, that, in those block grants to the states? And uh, if not, uh, why is it acceptable to send uh, the exchange funds to the state as a block grant but not a... Uh, but not the Medicaid funds. I, I don't think I would characterize the 1332 um, waiver option as turning it into a block grant. It is allowing states to come forward and say, I have a different way of, of uh, providing health care to the same number of people with the same level of, of benefits and, and, and cost sharing and without increasing the federal deficit. So. It, it's not a block grant waiver. It is an alternate way of providing um, care for people alternate to some of uh, what's laid out in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the 1332 also specifically references, cross-references, or references Section 1115 of the Social Security Act, which is the Secretary's authority to, uh, to provide waivers in the Medicaid program. 
and in fact, it, it requires that if a state comes in for a 1332 waiver and wants to bring in um, uh, suggestions on Medicaid changes, um, that the secretary come up with a coordinated mechanism for dealing with the two waiver requests. So there's, there's certainly nothing that precludes a state from thinking about both parts together. They just have different authorities uh, to come in by. And, we are certainly um, uh, would would and are obligated by the law to think about them in a coordinated way if a state's interested in that. Let me make a quick comment about uh, the waiver idea. Waivers are much more important than some people might think they are. Uh, welfare reform bill in 1996 was actually initiated by states under Section 1115 that Cindy just mentioned. 41 states had waivers. And what the waiver did was allow the secretary tremendous flexibility in what he could let, let the states do that out and out violated federal statutes because he had the authority to make these waivers. And in the end, what the secretary did was say, if you have evidence, so you had to and imply some kind of data collection mechanism so you could really know what the effect of the experiment was. And even if you, your data shows that you save money by doing this, uh, the feds and the states would split the money. And as a result, 41 states did experiments, uh, or maybe not experiments, but new programs and collected information about it. And they did almost all of the major provisions in the Welfare Reform Bill that were so revolutionary and caused so much uh, you know, furor on the House floor and the Senate floor had actually been tested already in the states. Time, time limits, for example. Strong work requirements with, uh, with uh, what amounted to punishments for for individuals who did not meet the work requirements. So these waiver ideas are really crucial, and I think it's consistent with the whole idea of federalism that the, a lot of people think the federal government has too much authority over the states, and waivers are a way to loosen that up a little bit and, and let the states do some new things. By the way, we have just a few minutes left, so <clears throat> if I could ask you as we're uh, covering the last question or two to pull out those green, those blue evaluation forms and fill them out for us and help us improve these briefings in the, in the future uh, and cover subjects that you'd like to see covered, uh, we'd very much appreciate that. Yes, you've been very patient. Hi, Lara Colgan from the National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care. And my question is more of a general one, and I pose it to anyone on the panel. Um, and it speaks directly to Cindy's point that 5% of um, Medicaid beneficiaries are accounting for 54% of Medicaid spending. And I know that the, um, I guess the regulations, the requirements have not necessarily been completely fleshed out yet. But how do you see accountable care organizations or ACOs sort of um, coming into this role and maybe addressing that particular um, point that you made about this disproportionate spending um, that is occurring? I think the the I think your your question um, uh, raises maybe two two different points. One is um, the theory of an accountable care organization, and of course, if you get ten people in a room and say what's an accountable care organization, you probably have fifteen or fifteen hundred different opinions. Um, uh, but certainly, the theory is integrated care uh, system of delivering care, um, and. Um, and I think everyone would agree that integrated system of delivery care needs to think about bringing behavioral health and physical health together. So uh, we, we are, um, uh, there are lots of states coming to us, whether it's through regular Medicaid rules in terms of how to combine um, their services on uh, or their delivery systems, whether it's through an 1115, whether it's through an innovation center or, or specifically as an ACO, just really thinking about that integrated care delivery system. It isn't always easy and as Andy's um, uh, uh, chart on the cost of health reform indicates, um, mental health services often have a, a separate trajectory of, of funding um, in the states and in the communities, and so that makes it sometimes difficult for states to do that innovation in integration. But whether it's a fa accountable care organizations or other methods of promoting integrated care, I think that's really important. 
the other thing, and, and they do compose a substantial amount of the 54% um, of, of the expenditures. Um, the other thing I would just mention is there's also a health home option created by the Affordable Care Act, which gives states an extra 90% um, match rate um, for the coordination of care for people with uh, multiple chronic care conditions. And we think also that provides a lot of opportunities to integrate care for people with mental health issues. Well, uh, where has the time gone? Um, I, we apologize to all of you who took the time to fill out green question cards. We just couldn't get to them. So uh, I guess the, the moral of that story is you really got to go get to the microphone and fight your way uh, uh, into verbalizing the question to make sure that it gets asked. Uh, but uh, we, we are very appreciative of your participation and uh, remind you that we're going to do this again next Friday uh, on the topic of Medicare. Uh, we're actually going to be on the House side for the first time in a long time, so uh, it ought to be a little more convenient for some of you anyway, and less convenient for others. Uh, take the opportunity to thank our friends at the Kaiser Commission uh, for really uh, structuring this, this uh, briefing from the beginning and participating so ably in it and ask you to help me thank our panel for addressing almost all of your questions anyway in a very thoughtful way.